So, yes, is this a case of very simply something good that turned bad? It may be, or it may not be. Just depends on who you are and what you believe, what you care about. Perhaps caring is one of the most important attributes. One of the final qualifications that I looked for in an employee towards the end of running my coffee shop. Someone who cared. Somebody who gave a damn. And I give a damn, and I fight for good. This is my pledge. So let's see what we can extract from history that may help us understand the present. I thank you for being here. I hope you're all well, and welcome. This is a test. Matt, in the past, has talked about how this reality, or the nature of it, whatever it is, must build things up and then break them down. A great example is Star Wars. The first three Star Wars episodes in the 80s were absolutely mind-blowing. So much truth. I feel like I saw my first Star Wars in the third grade, and it changed my life. I believed in the Force. I knew it was real. It resonated with me. At whatever age you are in the third grade, I believed 100% that this was truth as if my parent had shared this knowledge with me. And in fact, my mother took me to see Star Wars. I don't think she got the same thing out of it that I did, but I'm glad she took me. And my point is, the first three were absolutely mind-blowing. A take on our history and reality. A take. Different characters, different shapes of the realm, but telling a what seemed to me then and now to be a great truth. As much truth as you could encapsulate in a movie. Anyone who's read a good book knows that the movie always pales in comparison to the book. And when it comes to this great series, how can it be that you have three amazing movies followed by three piles of garbage movies? The sequels the last three Star Wars were an absolute joke. Didn't stir the soul in any way. Bad story, bad acting, and just really a lot of special effects. Totally unimpressed. A movie doesn't need special effects to be good. They can only complement it. One of my favorite movies is My Dinner with Andre. It's just two guys sitting at a restaurant table having dinner for two hours. Great movie. And it's because of the ideas that are stirred and invoked much more powerful than some special effects. And why must it be? Even in our research, dealing with the old world, everything is so much better. The further back in history you go, even better. Massive. Overly done, overly decorated buildings. And for who and what? And why is everything junk now? Just sticks of wood, as somebody said in a comment recently, stapled together. And that's all we're doing with our nail guns. Just stapling wood together. Covering it with a thin, thin facade that wouldn't hold up to anything out of the ordinary weather conditions. And why has everything degraded? Now in our research we say the buildings have degraded because we're not the same builders. Maybe it was a humanoid-like creature or one exactly like us, but not our people seeming to have a break in the timeline, a break in the cycle of humanity or mankind. When we look at the earliest photographic evidence, everyone is so primitive and backwards on their horse and carriage, in the mud, seeming confused and out of place. Again, a break in the timeline. But that would explain the degradation of the architecture. But what about when it happens in our lifetime, such as Star Wars, just ruining and almost made to cheapen the original three to somehow dilute the original three, like these truths are now being covered up in some way, simply by smearing 
smearing, schmear? Schmearing the excellent track record that the first three movies had. Something that seems to have been good now becomes bad. We could say in the most simplest way. Sometimes this could happen because a creator has just run out of imagination. We've seen this with great musicians putting out a few great albums and maybe having a commitment to publish some more and the music seems to lose its spark. And it's a philosophical question. People get upset because it doesn't sound like the old music. And should they just have continued playing their same music? In some cases, I've said yes, when I've seen what it turned into. And I can't say I know if this is part of the reality, as Matt would say, or if this is just individual, based on different circumstances from case to case. I've seen it in our own community, many channels sharing this history that we in this community talk about, only to flip-flop and turn against the community, and many question whether this is sincere, or if these are some Agent Smiths acting on a plan. Again, I don't know, but I see all possibilities, and I hope that's what I share on this channel, all possibilities. I hate to be told what to think, and I hope to never tell you what to think. These are only my thoughts. So on the subject of flip-flopping in our community, I want to talk about Ewar, or whatever his name is. At one point I was impressed with his work. In no way did I think it was original. It was a compilation of all the creators, including myself. All the researchers over the past three or so years, he had summed up into a five-hour video. And I thought it was great, and many of us did. And of course it was, because it was the sum of all researchers in this community. And I don't know if he did this by himself or had a team. I couldn't have done it by myself. I would have needed help as a video creator. That's my opinion. Would have required at least two or three people to produce the content that he did and the research, even to compile all the research that had been done on so many different channels. We in this community will have recognized much of it, but he pieced it together in a grand showcase. And he kind of presented it very forcefully, I felt like, kind of telling you what to think and making you feel like if you didn't think the way he thought that you were stupid. But in many cases, I agreed. And I thought it was just what we needed in this community. Someone to take all the research from all the various channels and put it together. Something I've been wishing and longing to do with my own research, just to go back and put it all together. At least half of my videos, I don't even remember what they're about. And essentially every video is my notes to go back and continue my research. But my thoughts are there is always time for such things. And I was very happy that Ewar had presented such a great case. Now, I ended up not agreeing with a lot of his points. And then other points I agreed with, but didn't feel like they belonged in this presentation. And mostly pertaining to the realm and the shape of it versus the history. Of course, they're both intertwined, but I thought for the sake of making a good case, I would prefer to focus on the history. Now, again, going back to Ewar, his work was comprised of many channels in this community, put together beautifully. And then he flip-flopped. He said he waltzed into a bookstore and grabbed the first book off the shelf, saw some construction photos, and discarded the community. And not only his work, but everybody that his work was based off of. And he hasn't been in the community that long. He had very little to lose. And one could say, this is a perfect sabotage operation. And to some extent, I think it worked. So what will I do? I am an optimist, and I take the good, even if we're left with a pile of shit. And there is good. 
even in this pile. Now this will not be the topic of my entire video. This video should be pretty random. It will have some Google Earthing, looking at ancient sites and land masses, but I did just want to read a couple paragraphs. It will lead into the next part, which will focus on the Erie Canal. But here I want to read Ewar's words before he flip-flopped. How can we trust the official mainstream historical narrative? The historical narrative does not make sense. It doesn't add up. If we take a closer examination at the ideas that have governed our understanding of history and the world since our birth, the history begins to fall apart. Sorry, I'm paraphrasing a little. We are told that the first true power tool was invented in 1895, when a German company combined an electric motor with a manual drill. The drill weighed about 16 and a half pounds and required multiple people to operate it. It wasn't until 1957 that a company called Bosch began designing power tools in bulk that were both economical and powerful. So basically like a home tool. So how then did our historical ancestors, a more primitive, underdeveloped people, design and build some of the structures we encounter? What about all the gigantic, monolithic stones we encounter? He says they have been cut with such precision, and we don't think they were cut. Ask yourself if you could repeat this today with the arsenal of equipment we have at our disposal. And again, we don't know. We don't know if they were truly poured or cut. In Baalbek, we see what appears to be giant stones being quarried. But in my opinion, I think it's a combination of everything. Just like today, we do everything. We build with wood, metal, concrete, stone, brick. No different in the past. The difference is the intelligence and stature in many of these buildings that the builders had that was different than us. More creative, more enduring, and more complex architecture than things we do today. But let me read on. This is a part in which he's talking about Antiquitech. I'm not sure if he's flip-flopped on this subject as well. But he says, look at the word cathode. Does it remind you of another word? Cathedral cathode. Like everything else, they corrupt the truth and hide things in plain sight. The controllers removed most of the cathodes in several of these cavity magnetrons. But there are still some structures today in which you can see traces of the old cathode still, still present. The heavy reliance on symmetry and cavities within these structures is not coincidental. The symmetrical ornamentation would have worked in a similar manner, causing the energetic particles to vibrate in a constant manner. And I made a video over three years ago called Unlimited Free Energy, and you can see all about what he's talking about here. It's explaining that certain shapes automatically vibrate and resonate at a certain frequency, just based on their shape and the quality of the metals in which the shapes are cast. And Russian scientists proved this over 20 years ago. Very old documentary, Russian documentary, sharing this knowledge on how Antiquitech works and that all these religious symbols, coincidentally or not, happen to be the best symbols for resonating or vibrating, hence why we see these symbols on the very tops of the most glorious buildings throughout. So we'll get back to this, extracting the good from the bad. But now I'll present you part two. Perhaps there's no point to this video. I can only share what I'm researching and what interests me. Here I am at a golf course. If you don't know, I believe golf courses are the sites of great, great structures of the old world and past civilizations. They're always strategically placed around a town center, prime real estate for anything but a game. And I believe this game has been created as this grand cover-up. 
Here you can see very carefully all kinds of things buried under here. And right now we're in Montreal, right next to this massive train station, which I believe is also of the old world. Just unbelievable and over the top and pretty much in ruins. Again, we can see the signs of the old world, massive buildings, much just scraped clean and in disuse. Some of the rails being utilized today, but nothing like whatever was going on in the past, just over the top, and the golf courses being part of this. And I think I've told you my mother was born in Montreal. I think right up here, Laval. A suburb and a lot of signs of the old world here look at the way this is laid out Saint Hubert or Saint Hubert is kind of like a chick-fil-a I enjoyed it as a child and again just how advanced everything is very circuit boardy everywhere we look and even the canals very advanced canal ways somebody had to shape all of this and here, a little amusement park. And again, all the amusements placed in the most prime, prime real estate. I mean, look how advanced this is. This has been cut by a people. This is an artificial island. This is so advanced and not something that would have been done for an amusement park. And I've been to this amusement park, La Ronde. It basically means the round. And here is Le Monstre or the monster, and I've ridden on this thing. I think this might be the world's largest wooden roller coaster. Even here it looks like it's in ruins. And look at this. It looks like tech. Again, I rode on this maybe when I was seven or eight. Never noticed the tech. And look at this mess of tracks. Surely this had something to do with something else, but not the point of this video. We're looking at the artificial land. We're looking at the artificial canals that are created in conjunction with the artificial land. And originally a canal is what led me here today. Ultimately, I was looking for the Chateau Frontenac, Quebec, a little further up the river. And here we have the Chateau. And it sits on this massive wall which looks like the remains of a star fort. Here we can see the wall. Just massive, and this wall just continues all around all of this. You just have beautiful old world structures, sharp corners, remains of the star fort. I mean, you can see it clear as could be here. And now just turned into some stupid roads and storage. Here we can see a bunch of junk. And I believe this is completely being utilized underground. These, what we are told are old bastions, are complete with an underworld. And let me just drop the man down here for good measure. And there's the massive wall. Anyway, I digress. And here, let us go back along the St. Lawrence, back to Montreal. And here we can see a canal. Now I believe it's all canal. Much of it fluttered over. But here clear as could be, canal. Undebatable. Artificial. And just looking like it. The proportions. Equal. And this part. This little inlet. And even here. A little inlet. Just a perfect, perfect canal. And is it fair for me to look at old canals? I think it is. We're told these canals go back to the early 1800s forget about everything. The early 1800s. We're talking about serious early model horse and wagons. No power. Not even good quality dynamite. Black powder. What came before dynamite. And we're told people just dynamited their way through creating a level and even canal. Not just here, but everywhere. Originally I was looking at the Erie Canal. Here we can see the remains of a star fort. We see the corner, and they're just chipping away at it. Good materials in a star fort. But I digress. Along this canal we go, 
And I guess I should first take you to this map that I was looking at. This map was really interesting to me. I'll zoom out so you can get a better look. There we go. And it's pretty old. We can see Virginia here. Virginia is just listed as this region. And we can see Iroquois, New Scotland, Canada, and New France, really occupying a giant chunk of land, even the parts unknown, and New Mexico. And here we can see Illinois, forgive me. It's called Illinois, and here we can see the Illinois Lake. The Illinois Lake, now Lake Michigan, and completely connecting. Back in this time period, we can see the artificial canals all over these maps. Look at this massive artificial canal stretching across the nation, connecting to the Mississippi, which even in this old map is the Mississippi, but yet stretching to what they call the high mountains, what I believe we call the Rockies today. But again, it's parts unknown. This region was said to be inhabited by giants, and even this map, as I've shown before, states that the lower part of the river is adorned with six noble cities, besides a hundred towns. Pretty bold. Pretty bold to call anything a noble city, surrounded by hundreds of towns in this early time period. Clearly pre-America seems to be a map for royalty, and very detailed, very advanced cartography. And what we can see is all the Great Lakes connect. A clear passage has been cut through, starting in here with the St. Lawrence River, St. Lawrence, turning into the first Great Lake, which in this map is called Lake Frontenac, like the castle that I just showed you. And today, Lake Ontario is what in the old map is called Frontenac Lake. And things look a little different, a little more squared off with Lake Erie than we see in present times. Very square. And then I just wanted to show you a map of the Erie Canal. So here we can see Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, and we're shown that this connection between the two lakes was artificially cut. Part of the Erie Canal. Again, let's go have a look at it. Here we go. So this was actually cut along with the Erie Canal. Confirmed. Artificial. Man cut this channel through. Beginning in 1817, construction began on the Erie Canal and was completed in 1825. Eight years in the early 1800s. Eight years to cut this canal. There are no firms, engineering firms, and experts at this early time period. And we're told this was a first. Just a first. People in charge had never done anything like this before. And with sheer will and determination and dynamite and horse and wagons, they managed to cut a canal through varying elevation. A canal is in fact harder to build than a road. A road you can go up and down, and if you choose the right route, you don't have to cut down into the ground. But a canal needs to follow a level channel. No exceptions. This has to be perfect. Now, there are some locks where the elevation is too high and they kind of flood a part of it, raising boats to the higher or lower part, depending. But nonetheless, this is just about as advanced as anything could be. And yet, it's some of the oldest, and some of the vaguest in our history. Very little explanation given to how people could channel a canal through 360 plus miles of varying elevation, full of forest that needs to be logged, no roads, and build a canal? I would love to speak to a canal builder, if there are any, even today. How long would it take today with modern, heavy equipment? 
I very much doubt it could be done with all the modern equipment we have at our disposal today. At 360 plus miles, constructing it in 8 years, they would have had to have completed 1 mile of canal every 8 days. 1 mile every 8 days. Here is a supposed picture in 1855. And just look at this. Look at the falsity portrayed. Look at these people. Little basket toting people. Look at this canal, how perfect with these megalithic blocks on each side, which are probably just poured old world concrete. And even look at this down here. All the artificial land. So here we go. We're told they would have just done all this in 1855. Clearly, they did not cut even a hundred feet of this canal. No way. Not in eight days, not in eight years. Not even this little part that we're seeing here, let alone 360 perfect miles with perfect embankments and lock systems. And look how beautiful everything looks. Unbelievable that they would try to portray and pair such opposing scenarios. The scenario of this advanced canal and architecture and then these primitive basket and barrel building people a wood people surrounded by stone and feats of engineering which they are not capable of producing in my opinion here again just to beat a dead horse a little this would have been just a little side project again a mile of this canal Every eight days, if we're to believe the speed in which they constructed it with their horse and wagons. This is advanced for today. This is perfect for today. And clearly it's held up. And this would be impossible. By these people. Not by any people. Clearly somebody built it. And we could do such things today to some extent. But not these people. Not the state of affairs that we are told the people of the 1800s experienced, or the way we see them portrayed even. These, at best, are builders of barns and cabins, little house on the prairie type people. Not a canal and castle and star fort building people. What do they even need to ship? And here I've asked the Google where the Erie Canal is. And they've pointed me to this spot. So just a little point. This would have been artificial. And essentially being part of the Seneca River. And now when I look out here, there are no rivers. Everything is simply artificial. Well, I guess that's it. I thank you for joining me. Do have a blessed day. I love you all. And I'll see you next week.